right. Joining us, Ms. Andrea McGee. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's a beautiful day here in Austin. Mm -hmm. So I know you're, we were just talking about how busy you are, um, but let's kind of go back to start uh, mid-March when the whole COVID thing started and kind of fill us in on what you were up to, what you had planned for the spring and the summer. And then once everything kind of got shaken up and screwed up for everybody, what have you been up to over the last five, six, seven months? Yeah, so it's been, uh, there's a nice car alarm <laughs> going off as I begin. <laughs> um, it's been a bit like that, you know, unexpected. You um, so prior to, to the lockdown, to the quarantine, <clears throat> Uh, I have plenty of projects that I'm part of, but my main project is Beetroot Revival. Um, it's a duo here in town. We came over. I'm originally from Ireland and my music partner is from England. And we came over six years ago and just, you know, created a life for ourselves in the United States. Um, and just have been kind of climbing the ladder slowly with different opportunities and, and making it so that we can live the life we want to. And coming up to the summer there of 2020, you know, things have been progressively getting bigger and better, like slowly. You want it to go really fast, but it's, it's definitely been a climb. We had a lot of touring planned. Um, we've been the opening act for Brian Wilson for the past, um, gosh, I think it's three years. Wow. We were due to go back to Europe in May and join that tour again. And uh, we released our most recent album it's actually a year old now but we were still commencing the touring of that you know because you obviously you just you figure that out in different time scales but we we were about to do a little europe run for that so yeah it was a pretty drastic change you know when it started you were everyone was a bit like oh is this real and uh, then it was very much real and suppose everything stopped we jumped on board pretty early into the live streaming world and have had real um real success with that and we're very grateful because it's meant that we've been able to survive and keep going and because i'm from ireland he's from england and we've done all these tours around the world um that we were blessed with and um, we have a quite a reach and on our first few streams it was almost like all those tours that we'd done over the last few years really came into play because we were having an audience from war you know all over the world join mm -hmm. us and that was when we realized that we were really grateful for technology at that point mm -hmm. to be able to do that. But that kind of slowly has whittled off like everything else. I think everybody's getting a little bit sick of the live streaming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, throughout after once we kind of got into the swing of just being in lockdown, I definitely jumped on the riding bandwagon. I try to get home to Ireland at least two to three times a year just to give myself that fix of like my anchor and my uh, unconditional love fix but not being able to get that back is definitely it's it's been sad it's been tough mm. and um but the joys of being a, an honest singer songwriter is that I've put all those emotion into like a brand new album so I have written uh, a lot of a lot of new songs so I have uh, a lot of honest sad songs <laughs> to uh to put out whenever the time is right mm -hmm. so yeah it's been a roller coaster ride like everybody but I'm I'm really grateful that I have a, a beautiful home I have a great partner in crime here we have our, a beautiful dog who is she's right beside I saw me you right petting now. something you down there oh. she's like mommy <laughs> I'm sleeping but um she like that it's it's reminded us of all all the little things, all the really important things in life. You know, you're constantly chasing this dream. Yeah. But the reality is we, we don't really stop and take in the here and now. And yeah. that was what the quarantine really showed me, like how much joy I get from food, from walks, from friends, from, you know, having a great partner in your life. Like it reminded you of all those things because I'm one of those people that doesn't really stop. I just mm -hmm. continually have been running for the last six years and I've, I've kind of enjoyed this stop to be honest. So, no, I feel the same way. It's when you're, when you're really serious about music and you give it everything you got, it really never stops. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of who we are is we don't really want it to stop. We kind of need that 
that action, you know, but we're also ambitious. So we, we work our butts off and everything, yeah. but it, you know, it is nice to stop. And I think as artists, we, we do smell, we do quote, stop and smell the roses. We take mm-hmm. the time to feel, we take the time to, you know, and you know, how are we feeling? And, and we put that into our music and we create and all that stuff, but it's certainly much different. This has been much different. Yeah, and it, it, it is, it is nice. I don't know if, you know, until we retire and become old and gray, I don't know if we'll ever get an opportunity like this again. Um, and I'm a little sick of it, to be honest. I, yeah. I, 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 I treated it the same way you did. It was nice and it was productive. I was able to get a lot done. But now I'm a little bit, uh, I'm ready for it to end. And I don't yeah. think it will for a little while. No, me neither. And that's yeah. one of the other heartbreaks I've just faced is that my visa <clears throat> doesn't stand for me to go home for Christmas. Mm. So there's certain categories that, you know, are, and I understand it's unnecessary travel, but it's so necessary for the soul, you know, like mm. I, I love my family. I have a very, I'm, I have a very close family back in Ireland and it's the reason mm. I'm the person I am and I have the talents that I have, it's all from that. So it's, it's been a tough blow to, mm. to accept. No, I'll have a great time here. I know I will, but I, for me, like Christmas is family. So mm. that's, that's another one of those, like, yeah, but that's a bummer. I'm sorry to hear be that. Patient. We'll be patient. <clears throat> the next time will be even more special. <laughs> yes, it will be. Yeah. And that's actually a great segue into uh, one of the most interesting parts of, of this whole podcast is learning everyone's backstory. And you're the first musician I've had on here that's from Ireland. And mm-hmm. um, I'd love to hear just about your musical roots, uh, where in Ireland you're from, your family's from. Um, it certainly seems from what I've seen uh, in your performances and your style that your roots go pretty deep. So uh, kind of tell us about, you know, what instruments you started on, what music was really influential, uh, influential on you growing up. And uh, just what it was like to grow up in Ireland, whichever city that was, and give us a little background there. Yeah, so I've lived my whole life up until like 27 in Ireland, uh, a, br- a couple of movements around there, but not very much. And from a very young age, I grew up in Belfast, which is in the north of Ireland. Mm-hmm. But I also spent half of my year basically in the south on the west coast in a place called Donegal, which mm-hmm. is the most beautiful part of the world, hands down. Um, And yeah, my family were very uh, much steeped in music. I actually started in Irish dancing. That was my first, you know, from a, from like maybe three or four, I was, you know, that's where the rhythm comes from. Yeah. Um, And then my family had a little folk band. So I would play from the age of seven with my dad and my sister on a Wednesday and a Sunday in our local pub. Wow. And that was just like our little, we were the McGee's and we mm. played every Sunday, every Wednesday and Sunday. And we all played the flute to start with. That was what we learned in school. But um, my sister was way better than me. She still is to this day. She's incredible. So I picked up the Celtic drum because my dad held down all the songs and the guitar. And yeah, so it all kind of started for me in, in traditional Irish settings. It's, all of the schooling in Ireland is like music is, is held at a very high regard. So mm-hmm. even from a very early age, I was also in an orchestra and I learned uh, classical music mm-hmm. um, from, I want to say like six, you kind of start learning an instrument, you pick up, you have all the instruments in the orchestra to choose from. So I had like, my schooling was very much based in like classical. And then outside schooling, I had like the performer, like the pub, showing and all the folk stuff and you know I think that's where I fell in love with songs and becoming a songwriter um so yeah that was my main start and then throughout my school I always chose music I always chose drama I was very performance based person Mm -hmm. and then I studied a degree in music um when I went to university uh and then I got a rare opportunity at the end of my honors degree in music to uh, go in and kind of take over a high school uh, in England and become a high school teacher and get my PGCE, we call it. So I did that. And I actually taught in a high school over just outside London for four years, um, which was just a crazy, crazy thing for me at such a young age. But I, it was it taught me a lot about myself and, it, and it's helped it helped me grow as a person. And also everything was always steeped in music. And then it was one of my kids that, uh, you know, I would al- al- always tell them and teach them to like, find your passion, you know, chase your dream. And 
I'll never forget it. Like one of them just sat me down and I was having like a one-on-one with them. Um, and he was like 18. So he knew, he knew what was going on. And he was like, you know, we've been all talking about it, miss. And you, you tell us a lot, you know, well, we got to find our passion. We've got to chase our dream, but you're not doing yours. And straight up, I was just like, he just straight called me out. Like, and I was like, yeah. And then it was like a bell went off. And mm. after that, then I, um, I, I met my music partner, Ben Jones in a, in a, on a festival that I'd, I was still playing on the sideline and uh, he had planned to come over to America and try and like chase his, you know, make a different life for himself. And I was like, I'm coming, I, I'm in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we gave up everything, jumped on a plane six and a half years ago and flew straight from London to Seattle, nothing organized other than an itinerary of 30, 25 cities from Seattle mm-hmm. to Boston and, you know, we had some shows booked her- here and there, but not not really anything. So our attitude was that we find an open mic in every single city that we went to and we played at that open mic. And then from that open mic, everything just started spitballing. Mm. And halfway through that, that trip, we hit Texas and we came to Austin and we were meant to stay like three days. And we also came during South by Southwest, not not meaning to. So we were like, what the fuck um we were kind of hit by like holy shit every other band in the world wants a show and we're here trying to change our lives but um i don't know like it sounds all namby pamby but honestly on those three days like we we couldn't we couldn't get a show because it was south by but we went and did some open mics and from those open mics we just met people and our, we ended up going into Jenny's little Longhorn, which is like a little mm-hmm. um, saloon. And everywhere we went, we kind of told our story, not not like in a contrived way. But, you know, that was just when people hear an accent here, they're always like, oh, my goodness, there's like a spark of interest. Sure. yeah. Of and course. we were hungry and we were trying to create some opportunity. And I, I ended up getting to chat to the owner of Jenny's that particular night. She was just at the bar. And she was like, well, you from Ireland? I have, you know, everybody has relatives in Ireland, so it's great to hear. And she was like, you know, I really like your story. Can you come outside and chat for a bit longer? So I chatted and she was like, would you guys be here on Sunday? And I was like, no, we're actually meant to leave on Sunday or the day before. Um, Because at that point we were in this motel and it was like $500 a night because Mm. it was South by and it was disgusting and it was awful. But she was like, look, Dale Watson does chicken chip bingo here every Sunday. I'm going to let you guys open. It's a packed house. And that was basically our introduction. We were like, oh, okay. So we stayed, we made it work. And then after that, Dale invited us to open two nights later at the Continental Club for, it was uh, St. Patrick's night. So it was perfect. Um, And yeah, that was our introduction. We were meant to stay in Austin for three, four days. We ended up staying for like a month. We canceled mm-hmm. the rest of our trip. We ended up finishing it out. We went straight from here to Chicago and then finished it out in New York. But there was something about Austin that just like opened up and gave us this hug and created these opportunities. And then we just kept coming back, coming back. And we've just kind of built up a profile here and a life here. And yeah, there you go. There's my life in a That's nutshell. Awesome. And now we're here. Yeah. I'm now sitting here with a rescue dog beside me. Very happy. <laughs> I used to, I used to live a block away from Jenny. So I, oh, wow. I, I knew that place pretty well. Um, as luck would have it, I never actually played a show there, but I, I was very mm-hmm. familiar with the place, but yeah, that's very uh, fortuitous that you happened to come during South by and that it happened to be St. Patrick's day and all this it's, stuff happened. That that's my whole cool. journey, like no joke you know, everyone's like, well, how do you, how would you describe like how to build it? I'm like, it's timing and being prepared. Mm -hmm. Like, so timing is everything, but because we were prepared in that moment to change everything. And, and that's been from the journey, like from the Brian Wilson tour, from the Brian sets or all these tours that we've got, it's all been the right place at the right time and being able to back it up with like basically having your shit together and being prepared for luck. So it's the whole time, my whole life has kind of been moments like that where I just get to talk to the right person. And I'm sure I've talked to many wrong people as well, but, um, you know, maybe I just talk to everybody. (laughs) But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it's worked, you know? Yeah, timing is so important, but you got to be ready for the, you got to be ready for that timing. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. mm -hmm. So um, all the stuff you said about your background, that all makes perfect sense based on 
what I've heard and seen you do, it, it, it all adds up. I'm curious about some of your influences within the um, kind of the songwriting thing. So you've got the classical, you've got the Irish uh, dance and the Irish music background, all incredibly rich foundations. When you were in your kind of teen years and you know, you're becoming your own person um, and, you know, you start um, finding the songwriter in yourself, who were some of the people that influenced you in that realm, whether it's from folk or rock and roll or, or anything? Who were some of the people that really stood out to you in those years? I think for my songwriting, it was definitely, I was definitely leaning more towards like my dad's record collection then. And that was like, Van Morrison was very uh, influential I was ask in about that. that yeah. yeah, and obviously he's from the same time that I'm from, so he's like a yeah. hero, like a mass. He's a hero yeah. in the world, but a hero there. Um, I also listened to a lot of female singer songwriters as well. You know, I loved Cheryl Crow, um, a lot of Irish singer songwriters, Mary Black, and um, also, uh, why have I just forgot his name? Oh my goodness, he gave me my degree. He's an Irish singer songwriter. Oh, Paul Brady, sorry, literally one of my favorite songwriters ever. Um, and then, you know, I also, because I started in dance, I also went into Latin American dance and I was always performing as well. So like I listened to like Gloria Estefan and Tina Turner, like my, it's such an eclectic mix. And then, you know, Eric Clapton loved Sam Cooke and I loved all Aretha, like soul stuff really spoke to me. Anything that had a real raw grit to it somehow like called upon me and like that's why I feel like it's kind of hard to pigeonhole what I do because it's it's not traditional Irish in any shape mm -hmm. or form it's very sure. driven by rhythm but it's just honest and real so any artist that I felt was like honest and real like Alanis Morissette Jagged Little Pill like you know as cliche as it is like those albums like changed my life like I mm -hmm. like they got me through some some times and then obviously you have the big hitters, you know, like Paul McCartney and the Beatles and all of those, mm -hmm. like all the, the normal ones that every songwriter right. turns to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, I, I would stumble across people that haven't even made it that huge here that have really influenced my writing. There's a guy called Tom Baxter, um, just an incredible folk singer songwriter Seth Lakeman they're all people from the UK that never kind of transferred over here mm -hmm. um but yeah like a, a crazy eclectic mix and then obviously yeah. like doing my degree and having to teach music I obviously had to you know look into Debussy and like all those classic like I feel like you can take something from everything so that's, of course that's the way I yeah, and, look at it and and when I was you know I grew up in the midwest of the United States and uh obviously he was a passion about all kinds of music. And then it wasn't until I came down here, uh, really to the South, but specifically, you know, Austin, where you meet everyone else mm -hmm. who feels the same way, who has like the hundred different influences. Mm -hmm. So I definitely know what you mean. And I was going to ask about Van Morrison because, uh, I'm a huge Van Morrison fan, huge yeah. Van fan. And he's got that obviously huge rhythm and blues influence and obviously some Irish uh, folk mm -hmm. influence as well, but the jazz influence, and he's definitely got that grit too. I mean, he's got a lot of grit in his, mm -hmm. in his style. So he really falls into a lot. He checks a lot of boxes in terms oh, of yeah. what you said. Yeah. yeah definitely. Um, so after you did that tour, your first kind of thing over here, and you finished, you finished up in New York, I think you said, did you go back to Ireland for a while and then decide to move to Austin <laughs> from there? We basically we, go right to Austin. No, we knew straight away that like, right, this is the life that we want, but visas are incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So we had to keep coming in and out and in and out and kind of stabilizing uh, a situation so that we could build uh, enough evidence for us to get what they call as an O one visa, which is an artist visa. Um, so that took a bit of hopping in and out. And then I think that we did that. We figured that out within a year and then you get granted three-year access, three-year access. Um, mm. So yeah, it, it's been a lot of forward and back, but for the last six years, we've had two ones and that's just about to run out. So I have a dilemma right now facing me that is not a nice dilemma to have. You know, mm. it's the thought of someone taking away your life that you truly have worked your ass off and love yeah. and do not want to lose. And it just doesn't, there's not, there's no security and guarantee and that you can keep that. So we're, we're in the crux of that at the minute, proving our worth, proving our, 
status and then also uh, paying a lot of money <laughs> to, uh, to stay how do here. they how do they uh, you know what are their specifications or qualifications you need to get those renewed what do they look for with that stuff I mean it's it's everything everything from achievements from growth from mm. a touring schedule mm. from letters of support people that will vouch for you oh, and wow. then again the the shitty one just a lot of Benjamin Franklin's you know, oh, it, it costs a lot. So oh, we are, we're in the current situation of figuring that out. <laughs> well, yeah. good luck. Hopefully we Thank can keep you. you here in Texas. Yeah. Fingers um, crossed. Yeah. So let's go into your experience here in Austin. Obviously you kind of touched on, you've been able to connect with some major artists, Brian Wilson. I mean, it doesn't really get much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you said Brian Setzer. And so how has Austin been for you? If you pretty much been in Austin the whole time that you've been at, uh, had those visas, or have you lived in other places as well? Le always lived in Austin. Like Austin was a very clear home because we just got like it wasn't necessarily about the career here. It was about the life and the love, and mm -hmm. then the the fact that we get to nurture our career by being with the best players ever. You turn a you turn a corner and you run into like yeah. people that blow your mind. Right. Um, but. So that was home base, but I don't think you can't rely on one place for, for everything. So you need to grow and you don't know what, where opportunity is going to present you. So there was always this constant like traveling around mentality. And actually the, the kind of breaker for us to get us on these big profile tours was just a trip I took to California to see a girlfriend. And again, right place, right time, went into the right coffee shop. And ended up bumping into our now managers um, who manage uh, Brian Setzer and Clapton and some other people in a very, from a very tiny little unassuming surf hut in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, just just the right connections, the right time and the right place. Um, I, I built a bond there. And from there, we've just developed a really good relationship, a really honest, genuine like artist support network. Um, but always coming back to Austin as our home, you know, and this is really where we've built our proper fan base because we've traveled, you know, and done all those incredible tours and they really have garnered us some great fans. But what were, I would say our biggest fan base is, is right here in Austin with real people who come out every night of the week, rain, hail or shine. Well, whenever we could, um, right. to, to watch live music. I've, I honestly traveling around the States, I've never came across a city like this one with a community that just it drinks live music as part of yeah. its substance to breathe and survive yeah and that's where i'm like there's there it was an easy choice for us and every time you fly into austin my favorite feeling is when you come down the escalator and you just see the sign it's like and we always get a thundercloud and it's like ah we're back <laughs> So how much touring have you done over the years? Are you on the road, uh, you know, 50, 100, 150 days out of the year kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, the only reason I got to really figure that out was when quarantine hit and, and mm -hmm. I was doing my taxes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, even I would say even more than that at times, like I, I have to say I've, I've, I've run it hard. I've run us hard for the last, you know, six years every opportunity we got so the those big tours we would be out in the road f like n n coast to coast and then over to europe and back and that would have been like over an eight to ten week period and then like maybe here and there another month straight out in the road so it's mm -hmm. it's a like i mean there's so many every year's been different but the last yeah. couple of years have been probably the most intense and then come back how here you, and oh, go ahead. how do you like how do you no? I'm just. I thought you were wrapping up, but um, how do you like the intense road? Because I'm somebody who, who hasn't done like full years on the road, but usually I do like intense summers um, and often intense falls, and then kind of stick around Austin the rest of the year. So after like you know six, if the, if the had touring over the last eight ten years, but really kind of intense over the last six or so, and uh, you know it was great to start, and then. Um, then it starts, you know, it, it, it's still fun and great and fulfills you. And, and then, but some of the stuff that didn't bother you at the beginning starts to just get a little old, but it how, definitely, how is the intense touring? It definitely wears on you. Now we, yeah. 
we are have to we were so incredibly fortunate that our tours have been you know we did all the 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 little van tours with you know the first trip we did here you know and that kind of beat us up for the year Mm -hmm. you know for just in whatever we could vehicle like starting with nothing but then the more intense kind of worldwide ones they're definitely tiring but we're we've became part of this family that like treat us like being a part of like those bigger tours like we get to ride on the bus we get our bunk we get like we get to ride on the coattails of like you know the some of the greatest in the world so I I don't feel like we have a realistic kind of viewing on it because we've been so spoiled and so lucky because we've been treated like family they just took us we they felt that we added something to the show so therefore they embraced our talent and you know, really took care of us. And then when we do the little things on our own, you know, we'd find the frustrations would come by a lot more because obviously we were treated so fortunately, but I definitely get what you're saying. Like I get, we all get burnt and you want to come home and you just want to be home. And I know I love animals. I love my dog Mm -hmm. so much. So like my goal in life is to have a a tour bus filled with dogs (laughs) and just travel around like that, you know? Take it with that you. Take great. all the comforts of home. Yeah. Of course. So you were on, were you on Brian Wilson's bus and Brian Setzer's bus? Or they had like a side, a side musician bus that you were also on? Or were you on the bus with those, you know, legends? Uh, well, so Brian has his own bus, but that, that okay. tour has five buses. Um, oh, wow. So I was part of the crew because I also run all of our merch. Cause we're a mm. t- very tightly operated, um, set up you know there's a very mm-hmm. small footprint and then um, we gotta we gotta grab all the dollars we can so we just keep of it really course. um yeah. ben would travel with the band and um they've become lifelong friends like all mm-hmm. like we're that's the greatest part of all of that you know obviously it's it's great to talk to say or put it towards your profile but honestly the friendships i have made are friends i'll have for the rest of my life regardless mm-hmm. of if i whatever happens if i lose an arm or you know I don't know, my mouth gets sewn up or whatever. Um, that's the most valuable part of all of these things we've done is the people that we've met and the real hard workers that you get to mm. see behind the scenes of how those operations work. It really does take a team of angels, like, and they mm. really are incredible. So, yeah. That's great. No, I know what you mean by grabbing the dollars when you can i've we've uh, my project has always been a, a tight three-piece thing so we always do it in a van and mm-hmm. it's great it's very lean operation but i did a tour this past winter where uh, it was it was definitely one of the best paying things i had it was kind of a corporate tour thing mm-hmm. and uh i was when the contracts were getting sorted out, i was definitely like oh i can do that too oh i can do that yeah. i can do that <laughs> give me a little well, you do you have to that. you almost just have yeah, to yeah. You, le- you you learn how to operate like a almost like just a multifaceted unit you know you become your everything and even during this quarantine we've joked because we really have become our everything including signed engineers production managers like Mm -hmm. set designers uh like technology you know we have we've had to learn so many different skills of course and uh yeah also what you said about you know you get a little spoiled yeah once things start going a little better for you it's it's even harder to go back to the, mm. you know. The yeah, dog. that was the first few tours. I remember having a little battle with that. But, you know, that's the beauty of Austin because you come back and you're just surrounded with everybody that's kind of doing a very similar thing. So yep. you're, you're surrounded by people that get it, you know. And rather than mm-hmm. feeling this shame or this, like, disappointment that you're not constantly like this, you're constantly like this but having comfort and knowing that you're with others that are constantly going, Whoa, you're like, ah, I see you. We're okay. You know? Yeah. So uh, just to kind of close out the, the tours you've done with these, with these um, legends, uh, what if, I'm sure you've had a lot of highlights in, in those tours touring with Brian Wilson and Setzer and, and maybe there's someone else in there, uh, but are there one or two highlights of all those experiences, maybe a, a venue you really wanted to play that you finally got to play or some event that was just beautiful or, or maybe you got to share the stage with so-and-so or are there one or two highlights that really stand out from those tour experiences? I mean, there, there are lots. I have to say a the lot. first one that comes to my mind, um, I got to play in Dublin 
and that my, all my family got to come down and my niece got to get up on stage with me and do sound check mm. and like at Vicker Street, which is an incredible, um, a famous uh, arena, like a uh, venue in Dublin and just, it, it honestly it's mind blowing like there's been stuff like I, I one of the shows in New Jersey I bumped like I literally walked off and walked into Bruce Springsteen like mm-hmm. not knowing because he had a hat on and I'm also a complete airhead at times and especially if I've just because we were 30 30 minutes like on the clock on off like mm-hmm. and uh so things like that are just you know, moments of a lifetime that you'll you'll never forget. We also got to do a, a run with Jeff Bridges and um, that was just one of the kindest men you'll ever meet. And he was obsessed wow. with my, I play this Celtic drum and mm-hmm. I had to give him a lesson after over drinks. And, you know, those are things that you're just like, shit, that happened. And in the time you're just like running, running. And now I am like, wow, you know, but again, I, I, I have to like emphasize the most important and the highlights to me are of being the relationships that I have formed with like the crew and like people that have just went above and beyond to help us out and just show us support and love because they know mm-hmm. we're climbing, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Very cool. Yeah. It's, it, I've, I found myself remembering more things in the last like two months and having more nostalgia in the last two months than I can ever remember in my life just from the, Mm-hmm. being set and not and kind of looking back and not really knowing how to look forward at all it's like i keep thinking of all these wonderful wonderful experiences yeah. it's it's kind of it's a double-edged sword it's great and it's also yeah. like ah damn i miss it but, i know um, i know could you just can we go back there <laughs> yeah. exactly right oh geez that was great but um i think it'll it'll help moving forward it'll help you kind of maybe even more so relish those moments or yeah. really put yourself in the place of oh i'm here Mm-hmm. This is what, but um, well, I really appreciate this. I just want to kind of get one more, one more uh, uh, question to you, and that is kind of how are you looking for it? Now you mentioned you've got this stress of of a visa that you have to deal with. Obviously, we have the stress of coronavirus, but you also mentioned you have new music, and I've seen your your you know you have your I think it's pack right your your mm-hmm. all female group and obviously beat root and you've got a lot of pro- i think you have a solo thing going so what do the next three to six months look like for you or 12 months even um you know what do you have planned for yourself what's what's kind of going on so fingers crossed get the uh, get the residential thing sorted out first that's my priority and um, i've just released a solo album uh, during this quarantine time ben and i uh that's ben jones is also in beat root revival we both took this moment because we've over the last six years, we've piped out six albums for as Beatroot. And I think that as much as we've like we went on a roller coaster ride because we were like a couple to start with. And then we we figured that out that we're just friends and mm-hmm. we put all that into the music. But I think both of us were craving having our own little outlet. And that's what quarantine kind of gave for us. So we both released a solo album. And now that that's done, we're both really excited to like come back together and be like, right, number seven. What are we going to say this time? Um, mm-hmm. So that is on the forefront. And I have been writing a lot. Like the reason I released my debut solo album was also because I feel like I've written the next one. Like a lot of it is a concept of like being from Belfast, being from the North of Ireland. I grew up in the Troubles and seeing all the stuff that's happened during these last six months has definitely reminded me of a lot of the civil war that I was witness to as a little kid. So yeah, I mean, just finding a home for all of that creative, like, we, I mean, we can always, as creators, you're always busy. Like every day I wake up, I'm like, well, I, I can never not have anything to do. Like if I don't, it's because I'm mentally blocking it out because it's hard. But like right. every single day, I know that I could do 10 things like that could help me get a wee bit forward. But I also need to to find balance and just have a life as well. Cause I can get too kind of obsessed with it all. So as opposed to answer your question, staying productive, staying creative, but also living life and, and taking mm-hmm. the message from this lockdown that I believe the world needed to give us all. And that is to stop. Like mm-hmm. it's okay to stop. Cause for a long time, I didn't think it was. And right. I I'm realizing now that actually it's more than okay. It's, it's, detrimental like you have got to stop and live and see what life is all about so i'll be doing some living and some creating (laughs) 
Well said. And I and I forgot to mention I did listen to the new the new record. It sounds fabulous. Oh, Congratulations on thank that. You. Sounds really really good. And uh, yeah, I mean I I hear you. The whole the whole stop thing. It's like we didn't expect it. We got it. And now oh, that must be an Amazon person yeah. knocking on my door there. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't need me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and now it's like I'm I'm ready to get things going and stay busy again. But I I definitely feel the same way. It was. Uh, yeah. fruitful to, to take a pause and everything. So Andrea, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, good so luck welcome. with your, your paperwork and your creativity and everything. Yeah. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. You're so welcome. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Have a good one. Take care. Sweet. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.